Welcome back. Uh, so we will start with the clarification session. So to begin with what I will do is I will talk about the upcoming lab in the afternoon, the second lab. After that I will take some questions uh, from you related to the lab and after that we will do some questions that were uploaded on the uh, Google survey which all remote centers have uploaded a bunch of questions. I will pick up a few questions and uh, answer them. So going with the lab, so today's afternoon lab is on demultiplexing again which you have probably already seen as part of uh, lab 1 and we will also explore the protocol ARP, automatic uh, resolution protocol. So the first exercise is uh, kind of similar to the previous exercises except that we will explore SSH protocol. So for this SSH has to work, so uh, it is kind of a straightforward thing. You basically need to establish two SSH sections from the same host in other words. So this is, so what you are going to do is. So this is your machine and you have to identify another machine which will be within your subnet. So you find out what are the other machines within the lab where you are doing, determine their IP address and also the username password. So this will be the login details corresponding to this other machine. So let me call it host2, host2 has uh, a login you need to know what this login information is as well as the IP address or the name of this particular machine and what you are going to do is you are going to establish two SSH sessions. So basically in host 1 you will open two terminals, terminal 1 and terminal 2 and what you are going to do is within this terminal you are going to run SSH to this other host. And in terminal 2 also you will do SSH this other host, okay. By the way as I have mentioned earlier before you do any of these things you have to run TCP dump with the right filters. So that is your first step, this is the second step. The second step is to run this SSH in these two terminals, terminal 1 and terminal 2. So if you notice the IP address of host 1, host 2, so there are two sessions that have similar source as well as destination IP addresses. So this exercise is about figuring out how does host 2 as well as host 1 distinguish between these two different SSH sessions even though they have the same source as well as destination IP address. So that is with respect to the first exercise. So the next exercise is on the ARP protocol. So the role of ARP is to determine the MAC address given an IP address. So if you have seen the slides you would have uh, this is something which is obvious. So before I get into the details of ARP there is something which I would like to uh, clarify. So there are, so as far as routing is concerned before we get into the ARP I will give you some details. Suppose this is again your machine, let me call it host 1 and you are trying to reach a URL, let us say you are trying to reach www.google.com. Let us say you also used DNS and obtained the IP address of Google which I am representing as IPG. Now what you are going to do as a consequence of this is you are going to assemble a HTTP packet which will have this get request saying I want this particular um, URL 
and then you are going to open a TCP connection, it will have some TCP header, let us assume the TCP handshake is done and then you will have the IP header where you are going to specify the source IP as your IP host, this host 1 and the destination IP as the IP address of the Google. So, this is what you are going to specify. Okay. So, there is some portion that is here which I am reproducing here. So, here is the IP that we are seeing there. So, this and this is the same. Then you have to put a link layer header. Even here there is a source MAC. So, even here there is, so let me put it here, there is a source MAC which will be the host once MAC. Let me call it uh, MAC H1 and there will be a destination MAC. Now, what should this destination MAC be? So, this is a function of what the router does. So, what the router does is it is going to look at the destination IP address which is here and it will determine if this destination IP address is within the same subnet or a different subnet. Now, how does this know this information? So, when you configure the router, we will deal with this later, you would have mentioned that your subnet is let us say 102.29.star.star. .star .star .star. So, this is your subnet. So, this host may have an IP address which is 102.29.5.1. So, this may be the host IP address that belongs to this particular subnet. Now, Google's IP address will definitely not belong to this IP address. For example, I am just writing some random number here 55.25.1.2 let us say is uh, Google's IP address. You will notice that this is not in the same subnet. Once you determine that it is not in the same subnet, what you do is you know that this packet has to go through your next hop router. So, this destination MAC should correspond to your next hop router, but often what you know is the IP address of your next hop router. This information you would have obtained when you did DHCP. So, when you are doing DHCP apart from giving you what your own IP address is it will also give you information on who this next hop router is, what is the IP address of it. So, once you have this next hop IP address information that is when the ARP protocol comes into play. You invoke the ARP to ask what is the MAC address corresponding to this IP address of the next hop router. Let me represent it as NR. So, once ARP protocol gives you that particular MAC address, here you are going to fill it with the MAC address of the next hop router. So, this is where the host, the, uh, the destination IP address did not belong to the same subnet, thereby you are using the MAC address of the next hop router. By the way, typically this information you do not always invoke ARP because this information is cached. But in case it is not in the cache, you will use ARP to get the MAC address corresponding to your next hop router. Now, this is for a case where your destination IP address was outside your subnet. Let us look at the case where the destination IP address is within the same subnet. Okay. So, we are talking about a case where the destination IP is within the subnet. So, for example, you are this host 1 whose IP address is 102.29.5.1. Let us say there is another host within your subnet called host 2 whose IP address is 102.29.5.2 and in the terminal that you have, let us say you did ping 10.102.29.5.2. So, this is what you did. Now, as a consequence of this ping message, ping message basically is works on ICMP. So, you will have an ICMP packet and then you will have an IP header 
where the source IP address will be IP corresponding to host 1, destination IP address will be IP corresponding to host 2. Then you add a link layer packet, this is the link layer packet, where again the source will be MAC corresponding to H1, which you will know. The destination has to be MAC corresponding to H2, but you do not know this information. So, again what you do? The router at the network level will again look at this destination IP address, which is 102.29.5.2 and it will determine that this is within the same subnet as 102.29.star.star .star .star .star. thereby this end host since it is within the same subnet it is going to invoke the ARP protocol where it is going to ask what is the MAC address corresponding to IP 102.29.5.2. Okay. In return to this, once you invoke this R protocol, it is going to return the MAC address corresponding to H2. Once you obtain that MAC address, you will put it in here and send it out on the local area network and because it is destined, it will reach the host 2 correctly. So, this is the forwarding mechanism behavior. So, as you can see the role of ARP is basically to determine the MAC address provided you give a IP address. Okay. So, the exercise 2 is basically for you to more or less whatever I have said is what you are going to uh, work out on. So, a few things to note here is that you will be doing 3 things. One is you will send a packet to a host within the subnet. So, these IP addresses your workshop coordinator has to specify what are the IP addresses that fall within a subnet that are act, that are working as well as uh, you do not necessarily need a login information because just ping will suffice. Uh, you have to ping these machines. So, check that he is giving you IP addresses which are reachable. You also need IP addresses of hosts that are outside the subnet again your coordinator has to provide this information. Apart from this your coordinator should also provide IP addresses of hosts within the same subnet that are non-existent. In other words, if you were to ping any of these machines you will not get a reply based on ping. In this first case within subnet you would get a reply that are reachable and in this non-existent host within the same subnet you will not get a ping reply because they are unreachable. So, you have to figure out what ARP does in each of these cases. So, the behavior you sh see should correspond to what I have explained. In other words, that is the behavior the returning MAC address should conform to the behavior that I have explained. So, that is with respect to exercise 2. Now, coming to exercise 3, exercise 3 is on gratuitous ARP. Now, you would be wondering what is this gratuitous ARP. Okay. So, we are dealing with, so let me write, we are dealing with gratuitous ARP. So, what we are, so gratuitous ARP is, is like any other ARP except that this ARP can be a reply or a request. Let us look at request first. When a gratuitous ARP is generated as a request, you are not expecting a reply. Earlier when you generated a ARP, you were expecting a reply. You asked what is the MAC address corresponding to the specific IP address, you want to know what that MAC address is, but when you are doing a gratuitous ARP, this is what we call self broadcast. You yourself are telling that this is my MAC and this is my IP. So, you are basically giving the relation between your IP address and your MAC address, you are telling everyone. So, when you send this gratuitous ARP as a request, you are not expecting a reply because you know, I mean this is the information you are conveying every to everyone. You are not really 
this IP address corresponds to your own IP address. So there isn't, and you know your MAC address. So there isn't anything you expect from others. Similarly, if gratuitous R is sent as a reply, no one asked for this information. You are just giving yourself. So you are not, this did not proceed. There was no request. No preceding request, you are just sending a reply. Now what is the use of such gratuitous R? So there are multiple reasons why you may want to generate gratuitous R. One is to detect duplicate IP addresses. So for example, let us say you want to use an IP address. So what you will do is when you assign an IP address, you have not checked whether others in the subnetwork have the same IP address. You just chose some IP address because it happens to be your lucky IP address and you assigned it to yourself. And it is often useful as soon as you assign yourself an IP address to send a gratuitous ARP. Let me call it GARP for gratuitous ARP. Now as a result of this, you are going to send out a mapping that says this IP address that I have assigned to myself corresponds to my MAC. Now if it so happens that this IP address was also assigned to some other host, this IP H1 which you have chosen is also assigned to some other host with MAC address H2, now this host will complain. It will send a reply saying no this is my um, IP address, in which case you will detect that and thereby you, so in other words when you do this you are going to get a reply that will say this corresponds to this. Then you will detect a duplicate IP address and thereby you have to change your IP address. So this is one use of gratuitous R. Not only that, there are other uses of gratuitous R which have to do with caching R entries. So whenever you have sent an R, so you have changed your IP address, but your other machines within your network may remember your previous, so for example this is your host 1 which had MAC address H1 and you have now uh, either changed your IP address, so earlier you were using IP H1, now let us say you are using IP H11, so you have changed your IP address, so this is what you were using earlier, now you have changed to IP H11. Now you want everyone to know that this IP H11 now corresponds to MAC H1, okay. So when you send this gratuitous ARP, they are going to make a note of this. So it is like a broadcast that is telling everyone that see I have changed my IP address, so start using uh, this. Similarly, if you were to retain the same IP address, but if you were to change your network card, even then you can advertise to everyone that this is my new information. So this, this way you are telling everyone what your new information is. This is also useful in switches. Uh, I do not know whether you, I mean this was covered as part of the course. There are these switches that are learning switches where they remember that if a packet came from on port 0 with some MAC address corresponding to H1, they know that any packet that is destined to this MAC H1 should be sent out in this direction. That is what switches remember. Now if you sent a gratuitous ARP, you are basically telling the switch this information that whatever packets you are getting, send it to me in this particular direction. So that the switches can also avoid broadcast of the packet to everyone and thereby use this gratuitous ARP information to uh, send it on the right port. So these are some of the uses of gratuitous ARP. So what you are going to do in this exercise is use this tool called ARPing which generates gratuitous ARPs. Uh, in order to manipulate ARP itself you need root permissions. So since you do not have root permissions, ARPing is a thing that will help you generate gratuitous ARPs. Even though I have talked about a little bit of spoofing as part of this exercise, you actually are not doing any spoofing because in order to do spoofing, first of all it is not correct. Uh, secondly, you need root permissions and so on which you do not have. So what you are going to do is you are just going to generate a gratuitous ARP for your own IP address. In other words, you will say 
this IP address of my machine corresponds to this MAC address of my own machine. In other words, you are not claiming somebody else's IP address. You are still advertising your own IP address and relate it to your own MAC. So this one you will see how gracious in this exercise you are going to see how gracious ARPs work in reality by using this particular uh, ARPing tool. Yeah, I think that is with respect to the lab exercises. So what we will do next is uh, I will take some questions related to the lab. So let me emphasize again, I want to handle questions only related to the lab right now. So we will do this for the next 20 minutes or something and then we will take questions related to concepts. Yeah, 1319. How to access desktop of a password protected terminal? Password was set through Vino preferences in the yesterday's lab uh, using SSH. I mean, this is something your coordinator has to tell. I have no idea what the setup there is. Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, second question is also there. How to trace a website using its IP address in TCP dump? How to trace a website? Right, using IP address, yeah. So you have, so TCP dump has these filters. So you can, so for example, you want to know what is the traffic that is coming from that particular web server or going to that particular web server. You can use the host and specify the IP address corresponding to that particular web server. You can even specify the host name. TCP dump will in turn do a resolution and get it. Does that answer your question? Basically, you, you need to use the host filter and specify the IP address of the server if you want to capture all traffic that is going to the server as well as coming from the server. Okay, ma'am. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, yesterday, uh, when I was doing the lab, uh, the exercise 4, uh, in the question, select the first TCP packet listed. So, in that question, you said that uh, to present the corresponding process, a like protocol, the packet is passed on. My doubt is that when a packet arrives at the operating system systems, so how the operating system is handling that process? Do you want us to mention that how the, the process is related to that? Or uh, the other question is that if a packet arrives, is that single process that is handling that uh, packet or does the operating system create a separate processes to handle that packet like each layer for each layer, the operating system is generating a single process, or is the operating system creating separate threads to act, uh, to actually encapsulate or decapsulate this packet? Okay. So the use of the word process is typically at the application layer. We do not use processes for representing the kernel level stuff. So whenever we say process, it's an application process that is listening on some particular port. So the way the protocol stack is implemented is at the kernel level. Uh, so there are these, uh, so whenever, so there is some code at the kernel, whenever you get a packet, it is going up the protocol stack. So there is the code, for example, as soon as the physical layer gets a packet, it is, you, it, there is an associated driver associated with that particular card. And the driver is a piece of software that is sitting in your machine. And the packet that you receive at the physical layer is passed on to that particular driver uh, program. And what the driver does is it is going to examine, it will process that particular packet at the link layer. And apart from that, it is going to examine the details at the link layer. In that, you will see that demultiplexing key. It will specify that after this, you have to pass on this packet to the IP layer. Thereby, there will be some other module within the kernel that is dealing with IP. So it is going to pass that packet to the IP. Now, IP again is a module that is going to look at the IP header. It will do some processing. And within it, it will have the protocol field. Based on the protocol field, it will decide should I pass it to UDP, TCP or whatever other transport proco protocols are there. And again, it is going to pass it to a kernel module uh, that is handling TCP or UDP. And that will in turn again look at the TCP headers, it will look at a port number 
and in turn it will pass it to the process that is listening on that particular port. So that is how a packet goes up the protocol stack. So when you say process, when you are dealing with the application layer, the users just listen on the ports, but internally within the kernel there is a lot of different pieces of code that runs at the kernel level that is going to handle this packet as it goes up. One more question related to the web, uh, like TC1, like for example, like TC1 and TC2 are in the same subnet, okay. So I am running a TCP dump in the PC1 which will capture the frames that is sent by TC1 or received by TC1, okay. Uh, so can I use any other options of TCP dump or Wireshark or any other tool to capture the frame from PC1, will I be able to capture the frames that is being sent by PC2 or received? by PC2. Um, like PC1 and PC2 are in the same submit, they are able to ping successfully, they are able to communicate successfully. So can I use a tool, to, a tool from PC1 to capture the frames that is being sent by PC2 or that is going to be received by PC2? Okay, so actually the voice wasn't very clear but let me answer it. I think uh, this is probably what you are asking. So you are asking whether you can capture packets that are somehow destined, somehow your uh, host has received the packets, either they were destined to it or originated from it or they were broadcast thereby your host still received them. If you generally want to capture packets that belong to other conversations within your LAN, in other words P some other host H2 is communicating with some other host H3 and you as host 1 still want to capture some of these packets. For this you need to put the card, so this needs special uh, privileges, not all cards may support it. You need to put the card in what is called promiscuous mode whereby it will capture all the packets and pass them up. Uh, not all drivers may support it, not all cards may support it, it is a function of the specific hardware, driver, so on and so forth. But there is a facility where you can put with root permissions a card in promiscuous mode whereby it will capture whatever traffic whether it is destined for it or not that is going on in the uh, subnet, I, I wouldn't say in within the local area network. But I will put a clause there with the recent uh, use of switches, switches especially when they work very effectively where they learn, uh, they are not going to broadcast the packets everywhere, they, are, they know very clearly in which port to send this uh, packet on. With the use of switches, it is not so easy to trace what is happening in the LAN in some other portion because the switches will not forward those packets towards you. Thank you ma'am. Good afternoon ma'am. Yes, uh, my question is related to the Wireshark. Mm. So I just want to know what is the scope of the Wireshark. So yesterday you told it is being used for capturing and analyzing the network traffic data. So whether I can modify the data and write it back to the network uh, traffic. And second part of the question is uh, what are the sniffer programs, how they work. And uh, can you design an experiment for illustrating TCP IP spoofing in the lab? Okay, so regarding the first question I had already mentioned this, Wireshark is a very passive tool. You, it All it does is copy packets both in the upward direction and the downward direction and store them and for you to do, you cannot really take packets from it and re-inject it. For that you have to write your own program dealing with key peak cap and so on. So you have to write a kernel module that is going to take the packets and do whatever it is it, it you want with it. TCP dump, Wireshark are passive tools. All they do is copy the packets and write that information into a file for you to look at. So you cannot do anything other than that. Anything else you want to do, you have to do kernel programming to do what you want with the packets. Uh, regarding your uh, second question on uh, whether you could uh, demonstrate spoofing as part of a exercise. So for this I mean you, so first of all, uh, so this is a security thing you need 
again, it depends upon a lot of uh, stuff. Unless you have full control over your LAN domain, web server, whatever it is, you could definitely design an experiment to demonstrate it. But for example, I would not do it at IIT Bombay because there are enough spoof detection software that run um, and uh, the administrators, network administrators will definitely not be happy with me demonstrating things like this to the students because they will do all kinds of mischief. Um, and there is also software that runs that catches such kind of behavior and stop it before it happens. So I will talk a little bit about ARP spoofing uh, sometime later. So, uh, but typically we do not design experiments um, based on this, more as a safety thing rather than, but if you so in, uh, are interested in showing, you can definitely set up such an experiment, but lot of things should be in your control. You should have control over the switch, control over the web server. You can't generally do it in uh, your uh, come your university's network because the system administrators will not like it. One three double zero. Hello. Go ahead. We can hear. You. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I have a very basic question regarding what is the difference between uh, a static IP address and dynamic uh, IP address? Okay. So static IP address is what. Uh, Again, it is a function of the context. So uh, in, the, in a generic context, what static IP address means, you have been assigned this IP address for your use for however uh, long you want. And typically, the configuration of it is done manually. So if you are using Windows, you go to the settings and uh, you can uh, set the IP address uh, within some place there. Um, the dynamic IP address, on the other hand, will be handled by a DHCP server. So you can't, whenever you want an IP address, you contact the server. Often the server allocates the same IP address as it has done before, but there is no guarantee you can get another IP address. So in other words, your IP address may change over time, though most DHCP servers try to assign you the same IP address. How we get to know about the dynamic IP address of a machine? So if you were, so for example, this also involves configuration. So if you are in a Windows machine, instead of manually setting, you will select the protocol called DHCP. Then it will dynamically assign. If you want to know what is the IP address that got dynamically assigned, you can open a terminal and the, using the CMD command in Windows and uh, type IP config. It will tell you what is the IP address that has, was assigned to you. There is a demo of this as part of DHCP in the uh, course content that I have uploaded. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you in uh, Windows, if you want to send a message to any other computer near you, those, those computers, those who are connected in LAN, so we use the messenger service and we use the command net send. And uh, what is the command used for sending instant messages on the nearby PCs connected in LAN in Ubuntu? So uh, there isn't any such, uh, so Ubuntu, it, it doesn't have any such service that it provides as far as I know. I could be mistaken though. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. My question is, uh, in Vysac, there is a property, pcp.lan and data dot data.lan. What is the difference between them? TCP length and data length. Yes. Okay. So TCP length will, I mean, I have to actually look at it uh, specifically, but TCP length probably refers to the TCP um, uh, payload and the data length may refer to the entire packet. Unless I actually pull it up, I cannot answer offhand. If you look at the sizes, you should be able to make out. As in when you, you click on, the, like I mentioned, if you click on TCP header, it will point out what are all the fields corresponding to it. Based on the size, you should be able to figure this out. I don't, I mean, unless I look at the option, I cannot answer now. Vysac is also available in Windows. Yes, you can just download it on Windows. GIS. 
Yeah, this is Soham Sangupta. Uh, very good afternoon to Dr. Kameswari. Uh, so, uh, uh, I was to ask you certain questions, but prior to that, I would like to uh, uh, tell uh, the participant who was asking the question just before me that uh, this uh, data dot length dot tcb dot length that is not directly a part of Vashrak. Uh, rather than that, that's a part of Win PC Cap. Uh, that that's a packet capture framework uh, developed by Intel. So it's open source and you can explore on it. So data dot length, I think it's the payload length that the TCP carries. Um, maybe the, uh, what the transport layer carries. And uh, TCP dot length is something which uh, takes part of the TCP header plus the payload. Uh, so uh, now my question comes. Uh, so I was uh, I have worked a lot on this uh, EIP spoofing. So when I work for, uh, let's say, in, inside, inside the in, intranet, I have made some, uh, my workshop to work on a promiscuous mode, uh, so it can capture all these things. So f given that some of my uh, students, I made them sit with uh, a terminal and uh, make some internet, internet working uh, activity, like checking their mail. And uh, I captured the MAC address of the particular machine on which my student was sitting. And I was able to replicate the problem of AFS spoofing with some uh, trick. So uh, in, uh, in the sequel to this experiment, I found that it's very easy to spoof uh, the uh, uh, MAC address of a machine, or rather the hardware address of the machine. Uh, so uh, from my point of view, so if there is a public LAN, where a person can spoof the MAC address of another machine uh, by some mode and get the data of someone else. So this is very dangerous. So I, I uh, have uh, uh, I've discovered a new way to prevent such attacks by augmenting the network layer uh, by creating a new ARP engine, which works as per the uh, some uh, in accordance with the art of cryptology, as well as it does not interfere with the existing, uh, you know, uh, ARP engine. So there's no conflict in the traditional internet tracking, but still it works for the people who wish to use them. Okay. Uh, so do you think uh, this can be uh, a new topic if I want to go for a secure ARP? Okay, first of all, I am not a security expert, so I don't really know. And I also need to know a lot more detail as to what exactly you have done. But at a very high level, if you say that it means changes to um, any of the switches or individual host, they have to install something which doesn't automatically come, then it's unless it comes, uh, it becomes very popular and Ubuntu is ready to install it as part of its, unless it takes on that kind of a role, it's difficult to say whether something will catch on or not. Um, so, I mean, I don't have a ready answer for you. I need to look at what your method is and uh, whether it is good or bad is a function of, I need a lot more detail than that. Still and I, so do, I don't I want to get into security in here because that is outside the scope of this workshop. So, uh, in brief, I wanted to uh, elaborate as well as your identity because the, it's, the it's the operating system in which the network layer and the transport layer resides. So if I augment the network layer or the transport layer, of course without uh, loss of backward interoperability, I don't you think it's going to be good for us uh, to Anything get our data secure? Anything which needs a kernel patch, no one likes to install. I will not install a kernel patch that is coming from some person unless Ubuntu itself tests it thoroughly and installs it within the uh, it's it's a personal networking for people who want to make their own uh, communication secure. That is fine. As I for said, it is there are plenty of ARP spoofing tools that are available integrated as part of switches. So unless you demonstrate that yours is something it does better than those tools, there is no incentive to try yours. And as I said, I mean, it's a moot moot because I don't even know what is it that yours does. So I need to need a lot more detail for that. So in the interest of time, I think let's put an end to that. I, I have an, one more question. Huh. So as per uh, the landing switches, as per the landing switches, uh, GRP is and GRP is concerned. So 
will it not be very wise to uh, use switches? Means I am talking about layer three switches. I am talking about layer two switches because uh, layer two switches they don't have access to the IP addresses. So most of the switches we see nowadays they belong to uh, the the layer three group uh, family. So is it very necessary to use GIP for them? Yeah. Because they already uh, work as a router. They are working at layer two, but ARP is a layer two protocol. So most of these switches do make note of. See, when you generate an ARP, you are basically uh, going to, it is not that they are looking at the, so when I said that it is beneficial for switches, this is what I meant. It is not that the switch is looking at the IP header, it is still looking at the MAC address. So for example, you were located at uh, some other, on some other port and you have moved your machine to some other port, right. Now the fact that you have sent an ARP which will have gracious ARP which is basically going to have information on that your MAC address has changed and thereby the switch can now know on which port that particular MAC address belongs to. It need not have been gracious ARP, any link layer message you send it would have figured it out based on that. But gratuitous ARP apart from this has other advantages where other machines can clear their cache based on what they are seeing. Okay, one last question. Yeah, 1341. Good afternoon, madam. Huh. Regarding yesterday lab. Yes. So, uh, SSH command is not working man, properly. Okay. What is not working? So, when I am typed. S S hash command hmm. shaker shell. Hmm. So when I am typing S S H followed by the IP address, it shows that uh, the root sorry there is no root to host. Some other time the port number refuses to connect that particular system. So you typically S S. You the syntax. So again, I mean uh, your workshop coordinator should have handled it, but to uh, extent. Typically SSH there should be an SSH server running on that particular machine listening on that particular port only then will it accept SSH connections. So you could test whether SSH open SSHD is installed on all the machines and whether it is listening on the specific port um, the port uh, 22 on that particular machine. You can use netstat if you know how to use that command. You can use netstat to see what are all the ports that are active. If the port 22 is not listed on that machine that means the server is not running. You need to ensure that the server is running for you to be able to do SSH. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I mean we will stop the lab uh, discussions now. Again as mentioned we have uh, some TAs available to help you with any questions you have about the lab. So you can use the chat email on two email addresses bodhitree.iatb at uh, gmail.com as well as t10kt.iatb at gmail.com. Apart from this we also provided you the helpline information. Um, all this information is there on the slides that was shared as part of the Google Drive. So under Google Drive look at the overview slides you will know how to contact us. So if you have any concerns questions related to the lab um, write email chat or call us on those helplines. So what we will do now is uh, we will uh, answer some concept based questions that were asked by the different remote centers. So I will ask, I will tell what was the question that was asked and I will also provide a answer to that particular question. So the first question this was asked by remote center 1073. The question was how to calculate the efficiency of a protocol does it depend on transmission rate. So for this actually the answer is a function of what the protocol is and what exactly are you trying to measure about the protocol. So for example, if you have designed a media access control protocol, okay. So
So if you are dealing with MAC protocols, which is the media access control protocols, their goal is to ensure that the system throughput is pretty high. In other words, for example, you are providing them with a 10 Mbps link and there are 100 users that are going to use this link, the quality of the MAC protocol the, or the efficiency of the MAC protocol can be along different metrics. One is you could see how much of this 10 Mbps is being used. This is called system throughput. In other words, if out of 10 Mbps, counting all the packets that got transmitted independent of who they belong to, you see that I am able to get 9 Mbps, that is pretty, pretty good utilization of the link. So, the, but this is system throughput. Now, you could maintain very high system throughput by giving all the bandwidth to just one single user and starve all the other users. But that's not a good thing. Your system throughput may be very high, but the fairness across the users is not going to be good. So another metric which is often used in here is fairness, where you will measure what are the throughputs that individual users are getting. So if there are, uh, let's make it 10 for ease. If there are 10 users, you want each user to be getting 1 Mbps, provided he, has, he or she has traffic to send. Okay, so when you are designing MAC protocols, you will evaluate them based on this. But on the other hand, if you are do dealing with routing protocols, by the way, within this, the transmission speed has a role to play. But when you are designing routing protocol, what you may want to design is protocols that have less overhead. In other words, in order for you to determine the paths for each of the destination, how many messages were exchanged as part of the routing protocol. For example, in order to determine routes to all the nodes, if one protocol is taking 1000 packets, whereas other protocol is taking only 100 packets, the second protocol is better. Not only that, you may also want to quantify what the protocol convergence time is. In other words, to determine the routes, the, is it taking 10 seconds or is it taking 1 second? Again, based on that, you will evaluate the protocol. So in summary, the effectiveness of a protocol is dictated by what the protocol is and accordingly, you define metrics to measure the performance of the protocol. So 1073 center, does that answer your question, whoever asked the question or you have anything specific? Uh, about regarding Wireshark. Let's not, I mean, I, so this question came from your center, so I just passing back control to you to ensure that does it answer your question or if you have any follow up question based on this. I don't want to take other questions. Okay, okay. I, huh? I understood your concept. Okay. Yeah, these questions, anything else, as I said, write to us by email or chat and we will answer. Okay. So another question again dealing with uh, the protocol stack is we always follow the TCP IP model in computer networks. So what is the use of OSI model? So again this has some precedence. So OS, so when people started uh, working on the internet, in the academia, they were working on this uh, TCP IP protocol stack. And then there was a major standardization uh, effort which thought that all these layers, which are the seven layers, sh are necessary. And they came up with this OSI protocol stack. But academia was focusing on the TCP IP and they came up with only five layers and they had already implemented them on many machines which people were using. So later when OSI standardized it and wanted people to use it, it was very difficult for them to push their model because the current implementations had this five uh, stacks already. So OSI never caught on. Not only that, uh, it was also felt that a lot of the functionality which is uh, the presentation and session layer of OSI could be subsumed within the application layer itself. So there wasn't any real need for those two separate layers. 
So this has led to OSI not being used and uh, TCP IP being used. So that is the answer. This question has come from center 1325. Hello? Yes, I can hear you speak. Uh, I, I would like to ask you one question. Uh, when we establish a two uh, SSS session, then we do not have a directly indication that the connection is established. Uh, it's a, uh, if, if we uh, compare with the client and server program, then we have the indi direct indication in the client program that there is an indication of the connection. But we do not have the uh, connection establishment in the SSS terminal or the SSS session. So if you are able to SSH, there is traffic that is going out. So when you run a TCP dump, you will notice that as because as soon as you type SSH some uh, uh, IP address, you will see that a TCP connection will be established to that particular IP address and you will have the TCP handshake followed by the SSH data and it will ask you for a password. So that means the connection is being established. If you are not able to, if there is no SSH server running on the other end, the very first TCP packet that you send, after that you will not get any more, you will get that ICMP error message or some SS, some error message which gets displayed to you. Uh, Ma'am, there is one, another question from our last exercise we have done in uh, yesterday. Uh, when we, uh, suppose uh, we run the TCP dump and give a ping command to google.com and we capture some packets and with the help of that packets, how we came to know what is the MAC address of google.com or re uh, relevant IP of this Google? You cannot know. You cannot determine the MAC address of Google because it is not within your same subnet. Whatever messages you are sending are going to your router. So router is hiding everything else from you. So you cannot know. Okay. No, actually in destination address, we came to know that what is the next MAC address of next hop node. Precisely. And uh, that is the uh, router. But yes. uh, we are not able to find the MAC address of google.com. You cannot. Okay. Huh. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So going back to the questions. So another question that was asked is, why should layers work under isolation in TCP IP protocol stack? Uh, it, it wasn't very clear to me what is this isolation. So if it means that there are different layers which have very specific tasks and you are providing an interface between them. So the reasons for this were discussed as part of the course itself. Uh, there are multiple advantages of using the, uh, this kind of uh, layering and we talked about uh, uh, modular which reduces the complex task into some simple tasks and then there is uh, reuse. In other words, the same module could be used by multiple higher layers. For example, if you create a TCP module, the same TCP can be used by web, it can be used by email, it can be used by FTP, so on and so forth. So this leads to reuse of a specific module. And not only that, it also leads to this abstraction concept where tomorrow you change some routing protocol, you don't have to change TCP. Similarly, you change your physical layer, you don't have to change your link layer. So this kind of reuse is extremely important uh, when you are dealing with uh, such a complex network. So that's the reason why there are isolated. This question had come from 1161. So any uh, follow up you? for this specific question? Uh, no, uh, I clear with the idea. Uh, I clear with the concept, uh, with the answer. Uh, the thing is, suppose if the protocols, uh, if they are developed under object oriented and where we can have this modularity abstraction and all, and suppose if the protocols were implemented with the C programming, but how we can expect that uh, there the modularity abstraction and reusability uh, can be seen in the protocols? So any layer that you are going to implement, as I said, as long as you specify that the interfaces are well defined. What is internally implemented is a black box. You don't have to care how exactly they are implemented. Uh, according to uh, my terms, the isolation here is uh, each and every layer is working unaware of the unaware of the other layer, and that's my intention uh, in keeping it as an isolation. Hmm. 
yeah that is what that's a good thing because of these three advantages that i have mentioned but there are a few disadvantages with respect to this also and these disadvantages are more apparent when you deal with wireless networks where there is lot of emphasis on cross layer optimization in other words sometimes it makes sense for you to know what is happening at the lower layers so for example the network layer may want to know what the error rate is at the physical layer so that it can choose paths differently so this is called cross layer optimization currently it is not supported by this uh, os this uh, tcp ip protocol stack but going forward there are some so it's not very strict layering some information does get passed up and down but kind of orthogonal to this so the layering is good for many reasons but there are certain reasons where layering is not that good also okay so this question is from remote center 1321 so what was asked is can you suggest some of the interesting pedagogy to explain the physical layer concept actually wait let me ask another question before that uh, so this question is from remote center 1136 which was we are computer science engineering background is it necessary to read physical layer protocols so this is from 1136 so normally when i teach uh, computer networks the amount of time i spend on the physical layer is very little so as you can see even from the concepts that were provided only three concepts were provided about the physical layer rest all were at the higher layers that said i think it is important to understand what happens at the physical layer that way you get a complete knowledge of what's happening um in computer networks you may not have to delve in deep into the physical layer but at least what does it do what are some of the common things it employs is something i think it is useful to know so i mean whatever i have covered i think is the bare minimum which will help you put the entire perspective of computer networks in place including the physical layer so 1136 so does that answer or is there anything else you would like to ask okay i will take it to mean that it answers so now let's get back to the earlier question which was 1321 remote center can you suggest some of the interesting pedagogy to explain physical layer concept by which i mean animation clips or simulator so physical layer uh, as i said we don't cover in too much detail but uh, baskar was also mentioning this so at iit bombay we use this uh, experiment where we use this torch lights to enable uh, communication so this kind of deals with the physical layer as well as the link layer concepts where the students are basically given so there are two groups each group is given a torch light and i give them a sequence of bits let's say 8 bits or depending upon 30 bits whatever it is and ask them to convey this bits building a framework using torch lights and at the other end i check whether whatever bits the other end receives matches the bits that they had sent um, so this tests many concepts including how do they encode so what does one mean does it mean light on for certain duration off for certain duration or do they have something even clever it also tests the framing concept which is more or less link layer but i think it is important how do you distinguish so i may give random bits sometimes i may give 8 bits sometimes i give 30 bits so you have to divide up the bits and accordingly send so how do you know when is the start when is the end of a particular frame what if you did do something but the other end interpreted one as a zero and zero as a one in which case what kind of error recovery would you do so all these aspects are covered as part of this particular design and they also tend to appreciate um, how communication actually works whereby they design all the necessary framework to enable this communication so that's an example of a pedagogical thing that we uh, employ other than that unless you get into lot of detail so there is a lot of modulation there is simulators for it uh, animations for it but 
I do not get into that level of detail uh, for an undergrad computer science, electrical maybe you can get into, but for computer science we do not get into that level of detail. Yeah, can you transfer it to uh, 1321? Any questions from the center? Yeah, ma'am, actually we have a doubt in uh, simulator oriented uh, teaching. Okay, which simulator you prefer uh, to teach uh, network delay and uh, network uh, delay oriented uh, uh, configuration? Which by which simulator we can uh, uh, represent the concept behind uh, network delay? I mean, NS2 will you can show some of these things via network simulator 2, which in fact uh, there is an exercise on NS2 which does capture some of these things. So, wait till the exercise. Uh, there is any uh, simulator is available like uh, Cisco Packet Tracer, uh, it is a more graphical user interface simulator in open source. So, when you I do not understand what you mean simulator or emulator or actual implementation the TCP dump type of thing, it is not clear to me what you are asking. Packet Tracer is something like TCP dump. Uh, kind of a thing or it could be a tool that is uh, trace route is a tool that will tell you what are is the path being taken by a packet. So, it is not clear to me what exactly you want. We have worked with uh, the Cisco packet tracer hmm. it is more uh, user friendly for us we can able to develop or uh, set a network with packet tracer we are familiar with that, but Cisco packet tracer is not open source. Is there any open source simulator or emulator whatever it may be, is there any one, uh, is there any uh, tool available for uh, doing that kind of job? So, you tell me what your intended goal is, I do not know what Cisco uh, packet tracer does because I have never used it. So, you tell that this is what I want to achieve and then I can tell whether there is any open source tool for it. Actually, in packet tracer, we can set a network, we can uh, uh, develop a unique network, and we can uh, uh, do subnetting, we can uh, assign IP address for uh, different uh, systems, and we can do routing also with okay, uh, graphically. Is, so, this is all you create the topology, and uh, you so this is all being done on the same machine, there is no implementation component to it, right? Yeah, actually. Uh, we have I, I mean Mac OS command also by that uh, we can uh, set a network in packet tracer. That is what that network is residing on a single machine, it is just a simulated network, is that right? Yeah, okay. Like that uh, is it possible to do with any open source one? Yeah, NS3 also, NS2 is there, NS3 is a recent one, NS3 is open source. Uh, you can create topologies, I think NS3 uh, is supports some graphical user interface also, but it may not be as sophisticated as uh, your Cisco thing, but uh, NS3 is something you can check out. You mean which uh, platform you prefer for NS3? Platform you mean Windows or Linux or what? Uh, operating system. NS3 I think works on both, so you can use it on either. In Windows also yeah. possible to install yes. NS3? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. This question is from center 1309. So, what was asked is during communication between two systems present at two different locations, how does one measure the drifting of clocks for synchronization purpose? So, the answer for this is you do not necessarily have to measure drifting of clocks because measuring drift is not an easy task. What is often done is you resynchronize the clocks periodically. So, basically you send a synchronizing bit pattern which could be alternating 1s and zeros periodically. So, that based on that you are resynchronizing the receiver with the sender that way your drift again gets back to uh, 0 and from that point on you will again start using again after some time you resynchronize yourself with the sender by sending the synchronization bits. 
which typically are a sequence of 1s and zeros. So, if you see many of the link layer headers, the first few bits are these synchronization bits. Okay, this is the last question for uh, uh, today. So, this question is from 1224, where asked was does interframe space matter with the size of the frame? Is there any relation between the interframe size, interframe space and frame size? Then what is it or how? So, that was the question that was asked. So, this interframe spacing is a concept that is part of many link level technologies. So, let us focus on ethernet. So, ethernet requires that one maintain uh, interframe space of 96 bit durations. Uh, I do not know if it is 96 bits, but uh, when you are dealing with 10 Mbps ethernet, it expects you to maintain an interframe space of 96 microseconds. Let me just check the value. So, ethernet expects that 10 Mbps ethernet expects to maintain an interframe space of 9.6 microseconds. What this means is you send a transmitted a frame by the time the frame ends before you can send after you receive the last bit of that particular frame before you transmit you have to wait for this much duration which is the interframe space before you can start transmitting again. The reason why the space is there is for example, you are a transmitter and you have transmitted. So, this is where you have transmitted the last uh, bit and supposedly there is another host that is starting to send data for you. And if you did not maintain this interframe space, let us say that started transmitting before this interframe space somewhere here then you have just now finished transmission you need to switch to reception. So, there is a different circuitry that is used for reception and to switch from transmission mode to reception mode is going to take some time uh, for the circuit to ramp up ramp down so on so forth. So, this interframe spacing allows for that switch especially for the transmitter you in order for you to switch from transmission to reception you need this interval. So, this interframe spacing is mainly to help for that. This has got no relation with the frame size. Frames can be as long as they want, but the spacing between two successive frames, there should be at least this interframe space gap. So, for 10 Mbps, it is 9.6 microseconds, but if you are dealing with 1 Gbps uh, Ethernet, it is 96 nanoseconds is the interframe space. So, going to the remote center which is 1224. Uh, suppose if uh, the, the receiving host do not reply back to the sender, uh, the ACK is not there. Huh? If there is no ACK from the receiving host to the sender. No A. If there is no ACK, if there is no reply, if there is no acknowledgement from receiver to e the sender. Ethernet does not support acknowledgements. So, there are no acknowledgements in Ethernet. Yeah, that is why. Huh. Uh, in such cases, there is no need to uh, switch over from receiving mode to the send transmission mode uh, and then from transmitter mode to the receiving mode. No, but mode. why should you purposefully? So, for example, if this packet was destined for this particular transmitter, then why do you want to purposefully? Uh, lose that particular packet. Fine, there are no acknowledgements at the link layer. That does not mean the packet is not lost. You have to recover it at the TCP layer then. You should never okay. design a system where you know if you did this, you are purposefully going to corrupt packets. So then this IFS is only for uh, uh, switching over from one transmitter mode to receiver mode. Yeah, in a given host to switch from transmission to reception, there is some delay involved. So, this IFS takes care okay. of the delay. In other words, you just transmitted a packet and someone else is sending a packet to you. If you do not give okay. this time, you cannot receive that packet. Okay. Yeah. Then one more thing is the uh, we said that for 10 Mbps line, uh, IFS is 9.6 microseconds. Yes. Yeah. yeah. If I if I if I use in a large buffer in a receiver in a host. 
can I play with an, uh, using buffer? Can I play? Can I reduce the uh, uh, interface? Uh, interface? Uh, sorry, interframe uh, spacing. Interframe uh, spacing, as I said, is a function of how much time it takes for the circuitry to switch from transmitter to receiver. It has got nothing to do with buffers. So it is a function of the hardware. Your hardware should be fast. Typically, when you are transmitting, there is a power ramp up and a power ramp down once you finish. So your transmitter design should be such that it can quickly ramp down as soon as it finishes transmission. That is a function of the capacitors you are using, whatever it is. So that is what is going to dictate this. It is a function of the hardware. So if you are going for, let us say, 1 Gbps Ethernet, the hardware is more sophisticated that it can actually do the switching in 96 nanoseconds. Thank you, ma'am. So we will end here, it is already 1, uh, so it is a lunch break.